Let us pray. Our great God in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We are grateful to you because every time we come, you reveal your mind, you reveal your truth, and you reveal more of Christ unto us, so that we too in turn can go to our various places, and wherever we meet people, we can reveal that same truth, that same understanding, and we can re reveal Christ Jesus, our Lord, your only begotten Son. We pray that as we come in here today, all that we need to do on our part, you'll give us grace to do in Jesus' name. We are praying, O Lord, that as your word tells us, we shall not be hearers of the word alone, but we shall be doers of the word in Jesus' name. We thank you for all the preparations we've been making for this coming retreat. We thank you, Lord, because of the praying, the fasting, the calling upon you, the invitation we're giving to other people. We thank you for the physical preparations we're making too. We thank you for the selection for the training of all the workers. And we thank you for how each one is doing something significant for this coming retreat so that we can together, corporately, with a united heart and a united voice, proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that all the people that will be coming to this coming retreat will meet in a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Use us, Lord. Make us channels of blessings. Help us to be our best, that the people around us may know that Jesus indeed is Savior, is Lord, and is King. We thank you because we know you have answered. Teach us your word even today and challenge our hearts to actions that will please you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, as you can see on the outline in your hand, we are considering together in this special study, gathering with Christ. Gathering with Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus Christ himself made this significant statement concerning whether we are with him or we are working against him. Whether we are gathering with him or we are scattering away from him. Matthew chapter 12 verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Very simple statement that Jesus made. But a kind of statement that tells us that none of us can be neutral towards Christ, towards the truth, towards the redemption coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we cannot be neutral towards God or the Bible. Every man's relationship with God is determined by his attitude to Christ. So if Christ is saying we cannot be neutral to him, that means also we cannot be neutral to God. He who rejects Christ does not have relationship with God. Why do we say that? Because you can only come to God through Christ. Rejecting Christ, therefore, will mean that that such a person does not have a relationship with God. The question is this, what shall I do with Christ? What shall I do with Christ? That determines what God will do with you in eternity. Christ is the only way to God. He is the door, the gateway, the entrance into the kingdom of God. And he is the gateway to the grace of God to make us live lives that will be pleasing unto God. He is the only bridge that can bridge the gap or the gulf between humanity and Almighty God he is the only way. There is no other way. For you to know the Lord, that is for you to know God, you have to go through Jesus Christ. And for the multitudes of people around you to know God, they have to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are ignorant of Christ, ultimately you are ignorant of God. If you know God, but the people around you are ignorant of Christ, ultimately, all those people too are ignorant of the Almighty God. Sin, 
separates us from God and from Christ. But as we come to Christ in repentance and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness and for righteousness, we are reconciled unto God. We are saved. We are redeemed. We come into Christ. We, come, we become branches in the vine. Now manifesting the grace to live for him and to lead others to him. You notice those two things. Number one, when you know Christ, you live to the glory of his name. You live for him. But that's, not only, that's only one side of the coin. You also lead others to him. Enemies of Christ do not only reject Christ. They also hinder other people from believing in him. On the other hand, friends and followers of Christ do not only believe in Christ and stop there. They help and lead others to believe and to follow him too. Our attitudes then and our reactions reflect either one of two things. Either faith, faith in Christ, or unbelief, unbelief towards the Lord. True believers lead others to Christ constantly. Wherever Christ is, in patterning grace, with his presence and power, whether in the church service or a retreat gathering or setting, true Christians will bring others there. We're going to consider three points very quickly. Number one, unique presentation. Number two, urgent proclamation. Number three, universal participation. Number one is the unique presentation. We're looking at a few scriptures, but I'm sure that you know this runs through all of the New Testament. Should I even limit that to the New Testament? It runs through the whole Bible. From the book of Genesis, which we're not going to open now, we see God far away at the Garden of Eden, making a unique presentation of the seed of the woman. And all the Old Testament illustrations and symbols and types, they make a unique presentation of Christ, the only begotten Son of God. In direct prophetic utterances, the prophets of old time make unique presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when you come to the opening chapters of the Gospels and the New Testament, you also have people that have heard about the birth of Christ making unique presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you come to Acts of the Apostles and we're not just talking of the baby Jesus, we're talking of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, sent by the Father, who died for us on the cross of Calvary. And then he rose on the third day and the rest of the New Testament from Acts to the very end of the New Testament is just making a unique presentation of Christ. Everyone that knew Christ presented him to other people, proclaimed him to other people, participated in the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world to God through Jesus Christ. There should not be any difference between those people and we who are living today. We need to get involved in this unique presentation. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2 from verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Yesterday on Sunday, I dealt with heart-searching questions. And were you not surprised to see that there's so many questions in the Bible? And these questions revealed much. And uh, that's why yesterday we, cons we considered those heart-searching questions. In fact, you'll see that most of those questions I considered were just in the New Testament. And do you know there are more than 1,000 questions in the New Testament alone? And in the Old Testament, we have more than 2,000 questions. All together, we have more than 3,000 questions asked by God, questions asked by prophets, questions asked by people, questions asked by Jesus Christ,
questions asked by disciples, questions asked by all different kinds of people from God, from Christ, and from one another. Here we have another question again. These wise men, they call them the Magi, that is the people that could see through the star and uh, through other means what had been happening or what was just to happen. And these people came from the east. That means from uh, the area of Babylon, actually. And they were asking an important question. They knew that the king had been born. The Lord had been born. The appointed of the Father, the Messiah, had been born. But where is he? Was he in Jerusalem? Shall we find him in Bethlehem? Where will he be found? They came seeking the Lord. During this uh, December period, when many people all over the world once again, are commemorating and remembering and singing and celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, they may not be asking the right question, but we should be directing the minds of the people to be asking the right question. Where is he, the Christ? Where is he, the Savior? Where is he, the one that is our peace, the bridge between us and God? Where is he, the one that gives us forgiveness of sin? Where is he, the only begotten of the Father? Where is he, the Messiah? Where is he, the King and the Lord of the whole universe? Where is he, the only one that can be the King and the Lord of my life, under whom I can put all my heart, all my life, and I can be to, in total subjection unto him? Where is he, that is born the King of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and I come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. You see, Herod had an ulterior motive. Because he had been told that Jesus Christ is king, king of the Jews, he was troubled. He felt that Jesus Christ came to compete with him. He never knew. That Jesus would later say, my kingdom is not of this world. That Jesus had a kingdom far beyond the stars, far beyond this age, far beyond this generation, far beyond all time into eternity. He has a kingdom that even the kingdom of Herod cannot compare in any way with it. But King Herod became troubled with all Jerusalem with him. Because they didn't know that the Lord was not coming to take what they had. He had a greater thing he was going to establish. Many people today, they get troubled unnecessarily. When their daughter gets converted, when their son gets born again, when their wife put their hearts or their lives under the leadership and the control of the Lord Jesus Christ, they think that because the son, the daughter, the wife, or the messenger or the subordinate in the place of work has now given himself or herself to the Lord Jesus Christ. They feel that that will mean that they are losing their hold on these people. How many times we are short-sighted and we are thinking that Jesus Christ is competing for the interest of what we have. Verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of all the people together, he departed. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And he said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Although uh, this is really not the major thing we want to look at, but look at this. These people, the scribes and the priests that Herod spoke to, they had understanding that scripture cannot be broken. And these people were not born again. These people did not know the Lord. These people had not repented. These people were people that did not have deep spiritual insight. And yet they knew this. They knew that scripture cannot be broken. For thus it is written by the prophet. And therefore they said in Bethlehem of Judea. If we say we are born again. Can we doubt scripture? If the people that were not born again. If they add understanding and faith in the authenticity and in the infallibility, the inspiration of Scripture, and they knew that Scripture cannot be broken. How about you today? 
How about all members of the church today? Verse 6, and thou Bethlehem. In the land of Judah, at not the least, among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately, privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me what again, that I may come and worship him also. Here Herod called the wise men, and no doubt, the wise men just wanted to discover where the Savior is, where the Lord is, where the King is. And Herod said, you go and find out, and make a diligent search. When you find out, come back to report to me. Again, let me point out something. That these people, because they thought Herod really wanted to worship the king, they would have promised him, we'll be coming back. We'll come and tell you where to find the king. But you will notice later, when God told them they shouldn't go back to Herod, they took the word of God, the commandment of God to be of greater effect than any promise they would have made unto, unto Herod. Now let us notice this. Before you knew the Lord, you could have made a lot of promises. Maybe you, before you knew the Lord, you promised a man, I will marry you. Don't, uh, don't worry about it. I just have given my hand to you. But your dowry has not been paid. Nothing has really been done. Then you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you remember, you hear the word of God. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then you say, but I have made a promise. I cannot go back on my promise. Listen to me. The commandment of God. Is of greater effect and is of greater authority than any promise you made in ignorance. They would have made a promise in ignorance because they didn't know the mind of this man, of Herod. But now in verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, not in the manger, notice that, because some time had passed now, he had been taken away from the manger, he was now in the house. When they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him. Notice that. They didn't worship her, Mary. Worshipped him, the son of the living God. That's why we don't worship Mary today. We respect Mary just like we respect other people in the Bible. Don't we respect Miriam in the Bible? Yes, we do. We don't worship Miriam. Don't we respect that wonderful woman in the Bible, Deborah? Yes, we do, but we don't worship her. Don't we respect and honor Esther because of her commitment and her consecration? If I perish, I perish. And she put her life in jeopardy to rescue the children of Israel from impending doom and death. We respect her, but we don't worship her. The same thing, we respect and we honor Mary, but we do not worship Mary. And these wise men, they did not worship Mary and those who are really wise today. Wise unto salvation, wise in scripture, wise because of the word of God, they will not worship Mary. They worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Today we are to make a unique presentation. You know the Lord, the greatest thing you can present to the Lord today will be your heart. My son, my daughter, give me your heart. Then you present all your talents all your gifts, all your abilities before the Lord, that now that I know the Lord, here is all I have with the totality of my personality and my time, I present unto you. Isn't that going to be a unique presentation? And then after that, you begin to present him to other people. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. The outline uh, says that we 
have verses 7 to verse 17. But we'll not be able to read all those uh, verses of scripture because of our time. Uh, let me just remind you of this story. These were shepherds watching over their sheep, their fold by night. An angel appeared unto them and presented Jesus Christ and told them that the Savior is born. In verse 10, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. You know something that interests me here? The angel did not even introduce himself. He did not even present himself. He was so taken up by the glories of the Lord. He was so taken up by the, by the light and by the glory and by the redemption that Christ was bringing. The salvation. He had no time to say, I'm an angel. My name is such and such. He just said, this fear not. For behold, I bring to you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Do you know then why we say that whenever we want to preach Christ, present Christ, present him. And don't at that same time be exalting the pastor, who is a pastor by the way. That we're talking so much about him and we're not talking enough about Christ. That's why we also say, don't even talk about yourself. Don't even mention your own name. Just present the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about presenting Christ, the unique Son of God. The, begot the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when you are taken up with the zeal, consumed with the zeal of presenting the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have any time exalting the pastor. You don't have any time exalting the church. You don't have any time exalting yourself. You just make a presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 11, for unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. In Matthew, we saw him as King. Over here, we see him as Savior. We see him as Christ, the Anointed One. The Anointed of the Father. And it says in verse 12, And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Don't let there be any confusion here in Matthew, which I read to you. It says, those wise men saw him in the house. Here it says, these people, the shepherds, they saw him in the manger. Why the difference? The reason is this. You see, those wise men, they came from the east. That is, they came from Babylon. And the uh, historians and geographers have told us that from where they came to uh, Jerusalem, it was more than 500 miles, more than 800 kilometers. And there was no aeroplane, and uh, there was no vehicle. All they could do, there was, not, there was not even motorbike. All they could do was to go on their ass, and they will be coming and coming. And it took them a long time. And before they came, Jesus had been taken from the manger. He had been taken to that house. But now you see these shepherds were just in Israel and they were in a nearby field. And when the angel told them, Behold, there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. They were nearby, so they just came and nearby. They just got to the manger and they saw him there. So don't let there be any confusion in your mind. In verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. Which the Lord has made known unto us. They said, we shouldn't waste time. We should go immediately and check up and find out to know what the Lord has really made known unto us. My question to you is this, my brothers and sisters. Are we so quick in obeying the Lord? Are we so quick in following up what the Lord has just shared with us? Are we so quick in arising and going to do what the Lord wants us to do? See what we hear every Monday, every Thursday. 
in our revival um, evangelism training service, as we call it now. See what the Lord is telling us in every Sunday devotional worship. Do we obey the Lord very promptly, very quickly, very willingly, like these people did? What a challenge to us. That we should make up our minds that from now on will be this quick and this prompt in obedience unto the Lord. And in verse 16. And he came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. They made known everywhere they went. They were presenting him, presenting Christ unto other people. We learned a few Mondays ago that when the parable was, uh, was uh, given of the king of the certain man that made a great supper and invited many, you see some people were complaining because I bought five yoke of oxen. Have me excuse, I cannot come. Because I've just got married, excuse me, I cannot come. Or because I have bought a piece of land, I'm going to look at it. I cannot come. But you see, these people, they abandoned their work for the moment. They abandoned everything that they were involved with for the moment so that they can make Christ known. Can we be like these shepherds? You know, this uh, Christmas period, December period, only comes once in a year. And this is a time when many people are thinking about Christ. Even over the radio, they will be singing Christmas carols, singing about Christ. The newspapers will be talking about Christ. And even those who are not regular Christians, even nominal Christians, even those who do not share the, the faith of uh, the Christian people, they at least they are open to um, to Christian message. And they go to do their buying and purchasing. They say they are buying for Christmas. Even those who are not nominal Christians, this is the time. Just once in a year like this. When everybody is thinking about it, don't worry about was uh, Jesus actually born 25th of December. Don't worry about that. Uh, was it actually at this particular time we should be celebrating the birth of Jesus? Don't worry about that. All I'm saying is this, that the minds of the majority of people all over the world are thinking about Christ now. That is the time we ought to arise with urgency and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. That leads me to point two. Point you, urgent proclamation. And I pray that you will be part of the people that are proclaiming Christ at this time. Won't you? I said, won't you be part of the people? Yes, you will. And I pray that God will help you. And everything you do in proclaiming Christ, in preaching the gospel, in telling people where they can find pardon, where they can find peace, where they can find purity, where they can find the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, through Jesus Christ, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Everything you do to proclaim His name, the Lord will reward you definitely in Jesus' name. He will reward you in this world, and He will reward you in the world to come. Get involved. Get busy. Do you see that many of our brethren in this uh, district here, many of our brethren are praying. I've spoken to some of the brethren, and some of the brethren, I'm telling you, they just wait upon the Lord and they are fasting. Have you seen some of uh, these uh, groups of uh, Christians that come to our district church here and they pray with tears, they pray with agony, they pray with concern. They want Christ to be known and they are praying that at this coming retreat that multitudes will get saved. Multitude will get saved. And they see, the, they see some of our people, the way they are so consumed with the zeal of the Lord. And they say that this retreat will be spiritual. It will be a retreat with a difference. Do you see that some of our brethren, as they are praying for the retreat, they are not even, you know, it's not like in the past when we talk about healing, 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 you are going to have children. I'm so impressed. I'm so challenged by the attitude of some of the brethren, even our coordinators that have come in contact with, that we have been able to discuss a little. They are burdened. They want people to be saved. They want people to know Christ. They want people to know the experiential reason why Jesus Christ was born. They want people to come to know the Lord. I see that the emphasis is just becoming deeply spiritual. And our people are praying. Uh, in the combined service, uh, the last time, uh, the, the prayer requests that were coming in, people want to be saved, backsliders want to be restored, we want to be sanctified, we want to have the power of God. I'm telling you, revival is starting already. 
revival is starting already. And I pray that none of us will be let out in Jesus' name. You will be part of it. God will revive you. You will be a firebrand. And you also will become a channel of revival to other people in Jesus' name. Now, this is the urgent assignment you and I have. Urgent proclamation in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Andrew never wasted time. And this is what you read about Andrew. If you just read through the New Testament. And all you find is that Andrew kept on bringing people unto the Lord. The very first time he knew the Lord. One week had not passed. One month, one year had not passed. He brought another person to the Lord. Some people tell us we have to have a theological diploma. Before we can ever talk about Christ to other people. Andrew did not have a diploma. Other people tell us we ought to have got all our Christian experiences. Be sanctified, be baptized in the Holy Ghost, be praying and be speaking in tongues, be very, very matured and know the whole Bible, Genesis, Revelation, before we can bring people to Christ. Now, Andrew had not got all that. And yet, he brought somebody unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something. You never can tell. You never can tell. That person that is living like an impetuous, rough person like Peter that is living nearby that you can bring unto the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim Christ unto him you never can know what that person can become you see Andrew never walked on water but Peter that he brought he walked on the water you know Andrew he was uh, not the one that spoke on the day of Pentecost for 3,000 to come to the Lord but Peter that he brought to the Lord you know he did that and you can bring people to the Lord. You see, Andrew never wrote any, any epistle. But uh, Peter, he wrote two epistles. You see what I'm saying? You can bring somebody to know the Lord. That can do something significant. That can do something very important. And therefore, you make sure that as you live here, you are talking to people, bringing them to Jesus, bringing them to know the Lord. I said this is what we know about Andrew. You know that when uh, the Jesus was saying, give these people to eat. And one of the people said, all these uh, 5,000 people, how are we going to find enough bread? How are we going to find enough food to feed all these people? It was uh, this same Andrew. Uh, with Philip that discovered the person the little boy that had the bread you see that and he brought him to Jesus do you remember some people or some Greeks they were saying we want to see Jesus we want to see the Lord sir we will see the Lord again Andrew became involved Andrew was always looking for opportunity to know the people that are looking for Christ that are searching for Christ that want to experience Christ and bring them unto Christ are you like that bringing people unto Christ. Have you told the people in your neighborhood about Jesus? Have you told them how they can have salvation? Have you told them how they can have renewal of their spirit? Have you told them how they can be revived in their own spirit? Have you told nominal Christians how they can know the Lord and be really born again? Have you told other people that are born again how they can grow? How they can go deeper in Christ? Now we're told he brought him to Jesus. Now let's stress another thing because you see this is very very important and many of us are missing this that's why i'm emphasizing it over and over because you see this andrew he brought him to jesus he didn't say he brought him to another person or he brought him to john the baptist some people are too eager they say i want you to meet our pastor I will take you to our pastor. I want to introduce our pastor to you. But Jesus is greater. I am not the savior. 
Let's bring these people to Jesus Christ. You see, we make serious mistakes. We talk so much about the pastor that the people don't even know the value of Jesus anymore. I mean, the people we are bringing, maybe you know the value of Jesus. You know Jesus is your Savior. You know Jesus is your Lord. You know Jesus is your sanctifier. You know Jesus is your healer. You know Jesus is your deliverer. But the people we are talking to, they don't know. They don't know. You see, all those people in the Bible, they would say in the New Testament, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, referring to Jesus. Other people will say, sirs, we will, we will see Jesus. The Bible says, when she heard of Jesus. But you know, many people in, the, in this city today, many people in our community today, we are not making them hear about Jesus very much. If we make them hear about Jesus, they will be saying, once I see Jesus. Once I touch Jesus, once I pray to God through Jesus Christ, once I ask Jesus to pardon all my sin, once the blood of Jesus will wash away all my sin, talk about Jesus, talk about Jesus, and bring the people unto Jesus. During this uh, December period, I know we're going to have a retreat. And I'm not just interested in only retreat, retreat. I'm interested about Jesus. I'm not interested in just uh, saying, come to church, come to church. I'm interested in come to Christ, come to know the Lord. Of course, after they know the Lord, they will want to follow us to church. That's wonderful. But Christ is the answer. Christ is the Savior. Come to retreat, come to retreat. Retreat is a wonderful thing. But what are they coming for? Come to Christ. Come to Christ. You can even make some people to be born again, and then they'll follow you to the retreat to grow in their new find, newfound experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Invite them to know the Lord. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. I'm, I'm going to stop there a little again. When Jesus beheld him, you know, Andrew, I like his spirit. I love the way he brought people to Jesus. You know, when Andrew brought Peter to the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to me, he cleared out of the way. He didn't stand a stumbling block between Simon Peter and Christ. You know, some people that bring others to Christ, they stand as a stumbling block. It may be there is a habit in their lives that will be making the people not to really see Jesus properly. It may be an entrance. Utterance. It may be a kind of communication. It may even be your kind of a habit in your life. Or it may be the way you talk about yourself. Hey, the dream I had, the revelation I had, the vision I had, my experience, the part of the Bible I'm reading, how spiritual I am, how great I am. You talk so much about yourself. So this person that you say you are brought to Christ, the person cannot see Christ. And you stand as a stumbling block in between Christ and that person. But Andrew cleared out of the way. And Jesus just directly communicated with Simon Peter. Why don't you bring people to Jesus like that? And the moment you bring them to Jesus Christ, you link them up so much that the man is able to communicate with the Lord, able to pray unto the Lord. And the Lord is able to communicate, able to talk unto that man. Uh, it will be wonderful if you did that. And you don't bring anybody between that man and Christ. You don't bring yourself between that man and Christ. And it says, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Sebas, which is by interpretation a stone. I'm going to say another thing here. You know, when you read the Bible, you are challenged to see the grace of God. You know, immediately, Andrew brought Simon Peter to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus concentrated on Simon Peter. And you'll be surprised that as we read the names of the apostles in the writing, whether you read in Matthew or you are reading in Mark or Luke or other parts like Acts, do you know that the name of Simon Peter always comes before the name of Andrew? And you know that in the Acts of the Apostles, when you want to talk about the, the church making decision, the name of Peter will just come up. And when you want to think about something significant being done in the church, you will think about Peter more than about Andrew. And Andrew was never jealous. Andrew was never angry. You know, the problem some people have, and I'm surprised, is that they say, uh, so and so is my convert, he has become a zonal leader, and I'm just an area, area leader. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You are just like Andrew and Peter. 
Some people say, I don't understand. I brought a so and so to, to know the Lord. And here am I. I'm still not a, a zonal leader. I'm not even an area leader. I am ordinary house leader. Well, to start with, there is no ordinary house leader. Because that house leader can just bring some people to the Lord that will become firebrands in the hand of the Lord. There's no ordinary house leader. I'm just ordinary house leader and the person I brought to the Lord is now coordinator. <laughs> he may even become a bishop. He may become an apostle. I would not be surprised. You may just be the Andrew. And that you are doing that work at the background. And people don't see you. And people don't know you. But heaven knows you. Why are you unhappy? You see, my own father never went to university. But then it was his money that sent me to school. And I became more educated than my father. And so the person who brought me into this world, I became more educated than him. Spiritually the same thing. The person you brought to the kingdom of God, the person you brought to the Lord Jesus Christ, is now perhaps coordinator. Praise the Lord. Is now perhaps the pastor of a local church. Praise the Lord. You say, my own is even more than that. Okay, let me hear your story. What's your story? Okay, I understand now. You say, the person I brought to the Lord is even now a national overseer in a particular country on the foreign mission field. Praise the Lord for you. What are you now? Well, I am just a so-and-so. I'm in this little district church. Look at what I'm doing. I praise the Lord for you. Brothers and sisters, no room for jealousy. No room for manifesting anger. No room for carnal comparison. No room for saying, look at where I am. Look at where he is, where you are. If God has ordained it, God will reward you for your faithfulness in the place you are. Get involved and keep on proclaiming Christ. Because you see, I listen to some other people that uh, they are so discouraged. And they are saying, well, uh, all the people I brought to the Lord, they have become very significant uh, figures and people in the church. And the church doesn't recognize me because I don't know this, because I don't know that. Uh, because of that, to the Lord, they have become very significant uh, figures and people in the church. And the church doesn't recognize me because I don't know this, because I don't know that. Uh, because of that, they do not want to evangelize anymore. But the Lord wants you to keep on producing other people so that as you produce these people that are giants and great preachers in the kingdom of God, God will reward you for it in Jesus' name. I'm sure we will do it. I said I'm sure we will do it. Let's continue. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now let me just quickly go to point three. Our time is gone. Point three is universal participation. Universal participation in Psalm 68. Psalm 68, and it's in verse 11. We read this scripture before, and uh, we've interpreted it a number of times, but let's remind ourselves of it. Psalm 68, verse 11. The Lord gave the word, and great was the company of those that published it. Everybody should participate. All members of the church must be involved in exalting Christ and preaching Christ. You see, there is no useless member in the body of Christ. Look at your own body. Every member of your human body is under the control of the head, receiving the life flow as the blood circulates in the body, functioning actively. Why then will any member of the body of Christ be idle? be useless and not function at all it should not be so every member of the body of christ receiving grace and help from above must function actively for the cause of christ therefore we must all be involved as this retreat is coming and every time not only retreat time, but this special time in particular now we must all get involved in praying get involved with intercession for lost souls get involved with preaching christ because he's willing to save all who will call upon him. It says the Lord gave the word. The Lord has given us the word already. He has given you the word already. The word of reconciliation. And it says, great was the company of those that published it. Great was the company of those that published it. Will you publish it? Will you proclaim Christ? Will you really, really get involved? If you will, can we stand up and make that commitment unto the Lord? And pray unto the Lord 
that we will participate. A lot of hands are needed. And if you are born again, you are a member of the body of Christ, we need a lot of hands in this retreat that is coming. We need people to keep on praying because we've been praying now for some weeks. And we need to continue this prayer even during the retreat. Even after the retreat, we need to still pray for the people that have come unto the Lord. And you know, a lot of preparations we need to make. You need to get involved. You know how we are preparing the retreat ground? You need to get involved. You know how we are going to have, you know, we have to buy food, we have to cook food, we have to distribute the food, we have to even provide some uh, utensils that we are going to use that the district church may not completely possess. You have to get involved. And we have to invite other people, we have to make publicity, a lot of things we have to do. And we have to preach Christ above it all. Preach Christ above it all. You commit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Can I hear you pray? And I hear you just raise up your voice to the Lord and say, Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. I will get involved. This is not recreation time. This is not resting time. This is not holiday time. This is time of business for the king. And the, king, the business of the king requires haste, urgency, complete commitment from every one of us. Get involved. Get involved. If you have not been assigned into any area and you know you are a child of God, you know you are a believer, and you know there is an, a special area you can get involved in, tell your leader in the local church, in the district church, and he will see how to, how to fix you up. We must all get involved. God will help you. And God will reward you. Pray and commit your service unto the Lord right now. No room for carnal comparison. 